Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. We'll, uh, we'll give a few minutes to let people filter in. We opened the session a few minutes late, my apologies. So we'll just give a, a few minutes for people to, uh, to log in, and then we'll get started. All right, I've got 102. So in the interest of uh, respecting everybody's time, we'll get started here. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. Uh, this is the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network's webinar on management of virus diseases. Uh, this is the second webinar in a series of cluster research updates that we will be holding throughout the year. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you wish to go back to it in the future or you know anybody who wasn't able to make it to the session today, uh, in, in a few days, once the webinar is uh, concluded, you'll be able to access the link. I'll be sending that out to everybody and then you can uh, find it again in the future. My name is Ethan Churchill. I am the current project manager for CGCNRCCV and I will be serving as a, a co-moderator for today's webinar. We are being joined today by several fantastic guest speakers. We have Dr. Tom Lowry, Dr. Justin Renkema, Dr. Wendy McFadden-Smith, Dr. Deb Moreau, and Dr. Harrison Wright with us here today, as well as Bill Armstrong, who is one of the CGCN Board of Director members. He will be uh, co-moderating with me today as well. Uh, we'll dive into the presentations in just a couple minutes here. Uh, just going to very briefly give everybody a quick update or a quick overview rather on CGCN and the, uh, and the Grape and Wine Science Cluster. So the application for the cluster was submitted all the way back in January, 2018. Uh, the cluster activities were built on past research in each province to create more of a national coordinated effort to address key challenges in the sector. It was approved back in May, 2018 for $8.4 million in federal funding through the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Canadian Agricultural Partnership, as well as $3 million in industry funding. Uh, the cluster takes place over five years, 2018 to 2023, for 23 different research activities across Canada. We did just wrap up year four of the cluster back on March 31st, uh, and so we're now currently in the fifth and final year of the current cycle. So you can see here the list of the different themes of research activities that we've broken them down into. Uh, the first one there, science coordination, that just helps with uh, CGCN administering the cluster. We also have strategic management of grapevine virus diseases. That is, of course, the theme that we're looking at for today's webinar. Uh, and this cluster theme looks at determining the occurrence of grapevine virus infections across the country, how insects spread these diseases, 
uh, and how disease impacts grape yield and quality. Uh, other themes for cluster activities include cold hardiness and adaptation to climate change, sustainable management of soil, water, and crop quality, optimizing the quality of Canadian wines, and crop protection and monitoring. Then the KTT activity at the bottom there, uh, knowledge and technology transfer is a big part of the cluster for us uh, and is part of the reason that we're running all the webinar sessions like we're doing today uh, to help disseminate a lot of this information and this knowledge out to the industry. We have already run one cluster of update webinar previously, the cold hardiness and climate change, which took place back in February. Uh, and most of these other themes will be having a webinar sometime in the future as well. And I'll talk a bit more about that at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the webinar here today. Just really quickly, that's uh, my contact information. If anybody has any questions about uh, the cluster or about CGC and RCCV, anything like that, you can send me an email or you can find more information on our website. Uh, so that's it for my quick little plug at the beginning here. Uh, I will let Tom pull up his presentation and I will do a brief introduction for him. So graduate of the University of Guelph and UBC, Dr. Tom Lowry has nearly 25 years of research experience at the Summerland Research and Development Center on sustainable grape pest management, including chemical and biological controls, leafhopper antecedents, and the use of beneficial vineyard ground cover vegetation. He has also conducted research on the epidemiology and management of insect-borne plant diseases, including work with grapevine viruses and their vectors since 2011. Tom serves as an affiliate with Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute, or Covey, and is an associate professor with UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. He served for many years on a number of BC Wine Grape Council research and development committees and produced the insect and mite chapter of the BC, Produc BC Production Guide for Grapes and accompanying photo guides for grapevine pests and beneficial insects. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan. It's a pleasure to be able to be invited to present. So I'm going to be talking about impact and management of grapevine viruses in British Columbia. And this is a multi-person. I'm representing a lot of work by a lot of uh, highly qualified people that's been conducted over a number of years. Uh, I want to point out a couple of things. Here's the photos of the main players. Uh, Wanted to point out, Dr. Pat Bowen has retired and we have a replacement hired, Dr. Uh, ben Min Chang. I'm retiring in under a year. Uh, they're working to replace uh, Carl Bogdanoff. And uh, you probably all know uh, Sudarsana Pujari in the bottom right here, who was uh, did a postdoc out with us and uh, happy to see him with his position at Brock uh, doing research, but also running the, the testing facility there. So that's the uh, cast of characters, but uh, we've been at the virus work for quite some time. The, the major uh, funding uh, arrived in 2013, investigation of great vine viruses and their insect vectors in BC. So we had uh, a number of funded projects since that time, including the current one, Field Strategies to Mitigate the Impact of Grapevine Viruses in BC. Wanted to point out something that was very important for everyone doing virus research in Canada. This followed, this research followed on a publication by Mackenzie et al. Incidents of four important viral pathogens in Canadian vineyards in uh, uh, plant disease. They also came out and visited uh, the Summerland Station. I had a chance to meet with some of them and talk about this. We actually started the first uh, sampling, first testing was conducted in 2011 uh, in collaboration. It was some BC biosecurity money and in collaboration with our local uh, provincial entomologist, Susanna Achimpong. So what's, uh, we have looked at a number of viruses, but I want to focus on grapevine red blotch virus and grapevine leaf roll disease caused by a complex of different uh, uh, unrelated viruses. So you can see at the top here, and hopefully everybody is familiar now with 
the typical symptoms of leaf roll, the down curling edges, even if it's a white variety, they are sometimes very difficult to see in a white variety. And then the grapevine red blotch disease shown at the bottom. So the presentation outline, I'm going to talk about the importance of grapevine virus diseases in BC, effects on plant health and grape and wine quality, and then some uh, information on management of grapevine viruses. So the first thing in this, uh, you can see this uh, is presented in a publication, Pujari et al. 2017 in plant disease. So the initial work was to survey for the different viruses. And as you can see here, this is work on grapevine leaf roll. And in this survey period, there was quite a high incidence of grapevine leaf roll. Even in the northern section here, where there's a, a lower production and uh, don't have a lot of the vector pressure that you get in the south end, there was still of the blocks tested 36% infection rate. Uh, the main one throughout all the regions is uh, leaf roll three, grapevine leaf roll associated virus three, but there were a number of the other ones as well. So it was widespread and in quite a high uh, incidence. We also noted that there was a definite spread. So we also knew we had the vectors. Here's mapping results showing a period, a time period for one block as an example from 2013, an incidence of 25.5%. And by 2017, that incidence had gone up to 61.6%. So we were getting a fairly rapid uh, rate of increase in grapevine leaf roll associated virus infections. Should mention also this particular uh, block it did not have large numbers of vectors. So uh, this is the, uh, an increase under relatively low vector pressure. So what vectors do we have? Well, we've, we needed to solve that. So a combination of taxonomic and molecular work uh, sorted this out for BC, and I'm sure it's true across the country. The main vectors are grape mealybug. You can see here the molecular work that was done on this. We definitely have great mealybug. We have a small number of a couple of other species, but they're relatively unimportant. We also have the European fruit lacanium down, shown down here, often uh, hiding under uh, bark. So you see the bark stripped away here. And then we also, we had to solve this one. Uh, we do have the cottony grape or also called the cottony vine scale. Pulvinaria vitis. It was previously mistaken or um, attributed to uh, cottony maple scale, but we've done a lot of work with this. It's definitely uh, cottony uh, grape scale. So we have three vectors and they can be quite common. So moving on from uh, grapevine leaf roll to grapevine red blotch, uh, the incidence initial survey showed a very low incidence of about 0.6%. And most of the vineyards that were sampled were planted prior to 2004. After we found out a little bit more about the uh, timing of grapevine red blotch virus, when it was spreading in nurseries, we went back and sampled uh, vineyards, focused on vineyards that were planted after uh, 2007. And when we looked at those ones, we did find a higher rate of about 1.9%. So not terribly high, but we also found that the uh, was natural spread of grapevine red blotch virus. So you wanted to do something to, uh, to figure this out. Uh, there had been a report that the three-cornered alfalfa tree hopper was thought to be a vector in the US. We do not have the three-cornered alfalfa tree hopper, but we do have some other species, including two that are both called the common name, uh, the buffalo, the, um, uh, the, oh, I forget the name of it now. It's uh, Stictocephala bisonia, 
the uh, buffalo tree hoppers. They're both commonly called that. We did the work and it was a grad student of mine, uh, Dieter Call, And you can see in the top right corner here that uh, using an artificial diet system where the insects were fed on infected plants, uh, grapevines, and allowed to feed through a stretched parafilm membrane into this preservative uh, sucrose solution. And then you could directly test that for the presence of virus. There was about nearly 500 insects were tested. The only ones that showed the capacity to transmit the virus were these uh, buffalo tree hoppers. So we have not yet definitively shown transmission of red botch virus, virus to grapevines in greenhouse trials using these buffalo tree hoppers. So the issue is not resolved and I'll give a shout out to uh, Justin Rankema who will be talking in a minute. Uh, he and others are conducting research on grapevine red blotch vectors with a focus on other hemipteran uh, insects. It definitely needs uh, some additional research. There aren't a lot of tree hoppers. They really don't like uh, grapes as a host. So believe that there is something else going on. We rarely find them in the vineyards. Uh, looking now at the effects on plant health, and uh, Pat Bowen, Carl Bogdanoff, Kevin Usher were involved in this quite closely. So looking at the effects of um, uh, leaf roll virus on, and I've lost the top of my uh, top there, but I know it's leaf roll virus, that uh, Cabernet Franc harvest data, if you can look at the main effect here, looking at a number of effects, yield, clusters, uh, clusters per vine, cluster weight, et cetera, et cetera. The main effect was on bricks. And you can see there's a, a one to one and a half or even approaching a, a two bricks difference. And it was dependent on the year. There was also uh, TA was affected, uh, a, a slight effect on that. And, this, you can see this uh, BRICS is really the main effect that we're looking at. So it's acting like a stress on the vines. We could, they looked at a number of other things as well, uh, looking at the, the uh, juice and fruit qualities. And you can see there was an effect on the skin anthocyanin as well that was fairly consistent except for one year. So a few effects, not striking though, but when you got to the wine, you could see that uh, grapevine leaf roll associated virus three vines resulted in wines with more vegetative flavors and aromas. So something you definitely don't want to have. You can see that it clusters. These were uh, experienced. These are winemakers with uh, very good palates. They tested the wines that were made out of infected versus non-infected vines. And you can see fairly good separation. The blue ones largely falling over on this side, poor quality wines and the uh, non-infected vines, uh, wines generally falling more to the right here. So it does have an effect. Uh, not as dramatic though as the effect of grapevine red blotch virus on grapevines. So if we look here on yield effects, and we can summarize this here on the right, yield was reduced 42%, 21% fewer clusters, 47% fewer berries per cluster. The berries that were there were larger, and there were more seeds per berry. So a dramatic effect now, looking at the effect of red blotch on fruit quality, uh, again, we can summarize it over here. Red blotch effects, soluble solids were four bricks lower, a dramatic effect. TA was uh, significantly higher, and there was a higher pH. So here's a, an example, sort of a typical photo comparing non-infected Cab Franc you look at these nice berries, good crop load and everything, and here's a, a vine infected. You can see the symptoms in the back here. 
infected with red blotch, greatly reduced um, yields and um, uh, of what turns out to be poor quality fruit. Again, uh, experienced winemakers did the testing at the center of wines made from this. I'll start with, you can see it in the back here, the quality of the non-infected wines. And then for the dramatic effect, if you look out here the, in the green, for 100% infected uh, fruit made, really this is completely unaccepted. This is terrible wine, vegetal, vegetal flavor, et cetera, like really not what you want. Even at a smaller components, smaller portion of the, the fruit being infected, you still could see there, there, it reduced the quality uh, significantly. So red blotch virus, there's really nothing uh, that you don't want to put up with that at all. Uh, some photos that you might want to see here, looking at some work that Carl Bogdanoff did with bud hardiness, you can see that there is a uh, change in the lethal, the uh, LT50 value. Basically, the red blotch infected vines are uh, less uh, tolerant of cold, so they're more susceptible. Uh, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we're going to have some of the red blotch vines uh, killed off uh, in a colder uh, winter. Uh, interestingly, as far as diagnostics go, the grapevine red blotch infected vines, the leaves turn yellow earlier in the fall, but they hang on. So you can see here's the flag vines here. They still have their leaves on. You can see a bit of the modeling here in the background and they stay on much later. Uh, that might be related to some of the lack of cold hardiness as well. So what do we do about managing grapevine viruses? Uh, so just a reminder, we can't cure them. Uh, obviously, we need to monitor and control insect vectors, monitor vineyards to identify infected vines, and then rogue or remove infected vines and replace with virus-free certified material. So some of the things we've been doing, control of insect vectors and the spread of uh, leaf roll virus. We've been looking at uh, effectiveness of dormant and summer oil sprays targeted to the overwintering uh, adults or the, uh, in the summer, in the case of summer oils, targeting the crawler stage. We've been doing, uh, conducting greenhouse insecticide efficacy trials. Uh, we've been looking at studies of parasitism and predation and also the utility of buffer zones. So here's some work, just wanted to show you this. This is uh, one slide of some of the, the uh, species here. These were, normally you have very high rates of parasitism and predation. So from a scale, the adult scale that were uh, in the spring, so they had wintered, we collected 13 different parasitoid species from these uh, reared from the scale nymph and six species reared from adult scales. So there's a, a large number of, of uh, parasitoids and also a number of predators as well. So normally what we find is that the, uh, it's insecticide use that is causing some of the serious outbreaks. Of course you have to control them, but choice of uh, uh, insecticides plays a major role. I just wanted to show quickly this uh, buffer work we were doing, mapping the incidence of viruses in new plantings and looking at in five min meter intervals, you can see this nice curve, a high R squared value showing that 97% of the infections, and in this case, it was uh, mainly uh, great uh, cottony vine scale, 97% of the infections occurred within a 50 meter uh, range from the vi infected virus source block. So uh, in planting large areas, establishment of a buffer zone might help, and then you'll want to uh, use roguing as well. And that's what I uh, want to show now. The initial virus infections that we often see were uh, due to 
in, uh, replacement plants, in plant, interplanting, and some of the material was infected. And that's what happened here. So these large blocks, the result here, if you look at the 445 infected vines in the first year that we tested these, the operator removed rogued 443 vines, a couple were missed, and the incidence went from the first year 11.5% down to 0.3%, and it bumped up a little bit, uh, but it was held very low. In a, another block adjacent to it, where you started off with 5.1%, carried through with this, uh, roguing the first year, but it uh, the next the the second year was not roguing, and you can see that the infection rate went up significantly from 0.26 to 1.1 percent. So that series of slides really was to show you the uh, effectiveness and the utility of uh, roguing. You really want to. Uh, do that as soon as you can and get them out of there, as particularly for red blotch. I just want to show that work was done with roguing of individual infected plants shown here by the center picture. Ideally, you would rogue out the neighboring ones as well. And uh, that's the pattern that we've seen is that most of the virus infection is spread to adjacent vines. So uh, in summary, uh, I've run through this quite quickly, but you need to be aware of the problem that viruses pose to the wine grape industry. And I hope I've demonstrated that that's, uh, they're quite a serious threat. Uh, knowledge of both virus and insect vector status in your vineyard blocks, yearly scouting of vineyards, flag and remove infected vines, monitor and control insect vectors, and plant virus-free certified grapevine material. So with that, I just want to thank uh, BC Wine Grape Council, CGCN, and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. We get a lot of help, of course, from our field services people and our participating technicians and students. And uh, obviously a lot of the, the bulk of the work is done in commercial vineyards. And so we really appreciate the support of the collaborating wineries and vineyards. So thank you very much. That's awesome, Tom. Thank you so much for uh, presenting today. And don't worry about uh, being too short on time or anything. I think that was that was perfectly timed. So thank you. Uh, all right, Justin, I'll let you go ahead and uh, get yourself set up and I'll do an introduction for you here in a moment. I did forget to mention off the top for everybody who is watching, uh, we will also have a Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Uh, so you should see at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen, a little Q&A button. You can type questions in there at any point, uh, and then we will we'll address them all at the end of all the presentations there. Uh, as well, for anybody who perhaps wishes to change the dimensions of the presentations when you're viewing, uh, and now you've got a screen share, which is a perfect example, right at the far right edge of the, the shared screen, if you hover, hover your cursor there, you'll get a little double arrow, and then you can drag to resize the, uh, resize the screen or the presenter's cameras if you wish to do that. Just a, a quick little reminder there for everybody. So uh, Dr. Justin Rankema here is a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Vineland, Ontario. His research program focuses on developing integrated pest management strategies in vineyard, tree fruit, and berry crops. He's currently working on spotted wing drosophila in berries, cyclamen mite and weevils in strawberry, leafhoppers and vectors of grapevine red blotch virus in vineyards, and oriental fruit moth, leaf roller moths, and ambrosia beetles in apples and tender fruit. Justin has a PhD from Dalhousie University, was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Guelph, and was assistant professor of entomology at the University of Florida with a research and extension program focused on pest management in strawberries and blueberries. Thanks for being here, Justin. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Ethan, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, so I'm going to kind of piggyback on Tom's presentation and get into a little bit more detail on potential insect vectors of grapevine red blotch virus in Ontario vineyards. 
and uh, yeah, go through the, the methods and the results that we have uh, collected on this uh, to date. Um, so this is a, um, a bit of a summary of what Tom has already shown to you today, but grapevine Reg blotch virus is a serious disease of, of vineyards and the most commonly you can see different foliar symptoms and that varies a little bit on whether you have a red buried or a white buried cultivar, either the red blotches that coalesce or chlorotic areas that become necrotic over time. And symptoms tend to progress throughout the season from older to newer leaves. Um, fruit symptoms uh, include delays in ripening, smaller berries, altered juice chem chemistry, and, and up to 50% yield reduction has been reported in some cases. So this virus appears to be spreading in our vineyards, but who is, who is doing the spreading? Who are, who are the vectors? So we, first of all, we know that grapevine red blotch virus is a type of virus called the Gemini virus. And these viruses are all transmitted by the true bugs, the Hemiptera. And within this group of Hemiptera, there's a suborder and that includes things like leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, and tree hoppers. So those are our main suspects. So before we ask about transmitting GRBV, we must first know whether an insect can actually acquire the virus. And so some work has been done in the US um, um, trying to get at this question. And a couple of papers have been published recently where they simply captured different insects in vineyards in California and then tested those insects for GRBV. And here's the, the positivity rates for some of the highest um, positive species. So there are a lot of scientific names. Most of these insects don't have common names, but the one in the middle, which is the three cornered alfalfa tree hopper, which Tom already referred to in both of these studies, tested high at fairly high percentages, 40 and 50%. And you can see some of the other um, species there. So what about vineyards though in Eastern North America where the complex of insects could be quite different than in California? So the, one of the studies also included um, some sampling in one vineyard in New York. And really the, the finding from that is that relatively few of these hoppers were positive for GRBV. And some of the higher rates for some of the species I've shown here and on the far end, you can see that buffalo tree hopper. So this is the species that Tom referred to. The zero out of three were positive, and so only three insects were ever found throughout the season in this vineyard in New York. So that um, it's the same thing that Tom is finding in BC. We rarely find this species in the vineyard. But what about um, Ontario and, and specifically the Niagara region? So we decided to do basically the same thing that had been done in California and in the New York uh, vineyard for two years here in Niagara, so 2019, and then uh, fewer vineyards in 2020. We set up sticky cards at um, six sites in each vineyard block, and at each site there were three yellow sticky cards, and we checked all those 18 cards um, weekly, basically from July to September. And in each vineyard we placed, uh, we had three of those sites, so we had half of the cards uh, close to a field edge. So in that picture, you can see ABC and then the other half DEF were uh, near the center of each vineyard block. So in 2019, um, of all the insects that we captured, this is the only one that tested positive for GRBV. And over the whole season, we only caught 19 of them, but 15 of them were positive. And this is a genus called Milano Lieris, And this is one scientific name you'll have to learn. It doesn't doesn't necessarily have a common name. And we think the species is Aridus, but, but they are quite difficult to identify to species. So this is a this is different, a little bit different than the tree hopper. This is a plant hopper. The family is Sixiidae, and there's really very little known about its ecology of this genus. We do know that the nymphs, though, are, are soil dwelling, they're subterranean, and they will feed on the roots, usually weeds and grasses. We're not, we really don't know if they would feed on, on, on grape roots. Adults have been collected on many crops, but, but, not, but not grapes, at least that I can find in literature, but they are not really known pests of any of those crops. 
So then in 2020, we repeated the, the sticky card survey at a few less sites, and we again found, um, quite, well, we found more melanoliaris uh, in 2020 than we did the previous year, and about half of them tested positive. And here uh, on the bottom are some of the other um, more commonly captured species and, and genera, and none of them tested positive. And again, we only found two buffalo tree hopper the whole season, and, and neither of them were positive. And then in terms of where we found the melanoliaris, so here's the six vineyards that we surveyed, and here's the number of bugs that were positive, the number that were negative, and the total. Um, so you can see that we did find at least one positive melanoliaris at all six vineyards, so it's, it's, um, it's pretty much everywhere. And, and the rates are 40% are or higher except for uh, one of the vineyards. We also ca captured a few of these um, melanoliaris outside vineyards four and six in the hedgerows, but none of those seven that we captured and tested were positive for GRBV. So then going on to what we know then about not only just acquisition of the virus, but also transmission. So from the literature um, here again, the three cornered alfalfa tree hopper has been shown to transmit GRBV uh, in greenhouse from a potted vine uh, that has been infected with GRBV to uh, a vine that is GRBV free. And this was you know, successful in three out of 15 plants. And they gave the insect 48 hours to acquire the virus and then 48 hours on the clean plant to inoculate the, uh, the clean plant with the virus. There's also been some work done in Oregon, basically um, trying to replicate the work that was done in California. They used uh, a couple different, well, they focused on a couple different species uh, two, two other different um, tree hoppers, and they have also found very low rates of GRBV transmission in greenhouse and lab studies from vine to vine. And so they couldn't, re they, didn't, they concluded they couldn't really replicate the results that, that Brian Bader had in 2016 in California. So we thought our next step would then also be to try some transmission assays here in Vineland and just kind of take you through the process, we went out with sweep nets and collected insects. Um, we we're focusing on trying the buffalo tree hopper and the melanoliaris plant hopper species. Uh, we put them in a cage for 48 hours with a GRBV positive vine so that hopefully they would feed on that vine and acquire the virus. And then we transferred them in batches of five, so either five buffalo tree hopper or five melanoliaris placed into a cage with a clean vine for 48 hours for the inoculation stage. Then we removed all the insects. Uh, we froze and killed them and stored them so we could test them for GRBV. And then we've also been maintaining these vines and then sampling them to test for GRBV. And we've got samples from five months and we're going to keep these for at least a year and continually test them. Oops. So here are the results. So for Buffalo tree hopper, um, after, after five months, none of the 14 vines that we put the tree hoppers on have been positive for GRBV. So there doesn't seem to be any um, evidence of inoculation. And then when we tested the actual tree hoppers, very few of them looked like they actually had acquired GRBV. So they didn't look like they were able to acquire the virus. Uh, the melanoliaris on the other hand, so far we haven't seen that they've been able to transmit the uh, virus to the vine. So, so all those vines have still been negative after five months. But, the, but they, it does look like they have been able to acquire the virus. So in terms of total numbers there, about 74% of the individuals did test positive for GRBV. So kind of look, try to ask questions about our results and, and, and figure out what's going on with this virus and the insect vectors, especially for uh, future work. So why was there no evidence of transmission, even though many of the melanoliaris acquired GRBV? And so probably it comes down to the fact that there wasn't any GRBV in these insects salivary glands after four days. So there's a really fairly recent paper that's come out of the Cornell group showing that GRBV is circulative and non-propagative in insects. That means the insect has to feed on a plant with GRBV and that virus has to go into the gut of the insect then it has to pass into the hemolymph which is like the blood and then it has to get into the salivary gland so that when that insect feeds on a clean plant it can pass the virus to the plant and so the Cornell group has basically reported that it takes 
at least 10 days to detect GRBV in the salivary glands of an alfalfa tree hopper. So which is way longer than the period of uh, two days of acquisition and two days of inoculation that we used. The only thing with melanolarias is that we did use them directly from the field. So even though they may have, some of them may have had already GRBV from feeding in the field, but we can't really figure that out from the way we did the experiment at this point. The other thing is that there may not necessarily be enough or a high enough titer of GRBV in those plants to detect it after five months. And even with uh, Brian Bader's work, after five months, only three out of the five, 15 vines were positive and they did not test the vines or they did not report testing the vines for greater than five months. So we may, uh, with continued testing, we may um, uh, you know, have some different results in the future. And then the other question is, why did so few buffalo tree hoppers only about 6% acquired GRBV in our study. And so basically I've already alluded to this, but two days might not be long enough for them to acquire the virus. Even though the previous study with alfalfa tree hopper, they had a 75% GRBV positive rate after a two day acquisition period. The Cornell group then five years later has shown that they really needs five, there really needs to be five days to, so that once for the, uh, the GRBV to show up in the guts of the alfalfa tree hopper. And this Cornell group um, got about 10% vine vine transmission when they used a 15 day acquisition period on grapes and then a two day uh, intermittent um, period where they put the insects on alfalfa and then a four day inoculation period. So this is a total of almost 20, 20 days. Um, and in terms of acquisition, well, it really could come down just to when does the insect decide to feed? Some insects may uh, feed right away in two days and uptake the GRBV and, and then other ones may not feed as quickly. So it, it, it could be you know, differences in biotypes of alfalfa tree hoppers from different regions and the way that affects their interaction with the grape plants. And then so next steps for our research, things that we're planning to do uh, this season and hopefully into the future is test more buffalo tree hopper for GRBV that we've collected uh, from the field. We just haven't tested very many of them so far because we haven't found too many on the sticky cards. So looking at um, using some sweet nets or by hand to find some in vineyards or also those that are found in the uh, edge vegetation and then compare rates if we find positive insects, how those rates change from early to late in the season. And then continue another uh, summer with transmission assays, um, basically trying some longer acquisition and inoculation times on those vines and perhaps um, looking at some different methods using the sucrose solution that uh, uh, Dieter Call and, and Tom's group has tried. And then also the Cornell group has looked at just transmission to bean leaves instead of to a grape plant, but it's a, an easier method. And we really wanna learn more about the ecology and the biology of these two suspect vectors in Ontario. Like I said, with Melanolaris, we know very little about what host plants it associates with, where it feeds and where it lays, lays its eggs. And some of that information could really help us um, if we want to try to rear colonies of these species in the lab for uh, continued work on them in terms of being vectors. One interesting clue that I just came across in the literature recently is that there's a, a plant hopper that's fairly closely related to Melanolieris and it is called Hyalesthes obsoletus. So this is a I think a species that is primarily found in Europe, and it is the known vector of Bois Noir disease, which is a phytoplasma, so not the same as a virus, but not too different. And what they have found with this species is that these adults, they will lay their eggs at the bases of different, um, basically, weeds that are growing around a field or in a field. And those root feeding nymphs feed on the roots of those plants where they acquire the phytoplasma. And then what happens is the adults emerge the next season with the phytoplasma uh, in them, and they occasionally enter uh, vineyards and feed on grapes where they trans, and then they can transmit the phytoplasma. So there's, but the adults are quite short lived, so there really is no grape to grape transmission, um, which is quite interesting. So, um, kind of our question going forward. Is there a soil or root feeding component to the spread of GRBV, which involves the, the nymphs of Melanolieris, which we also know are, are soil dwelling? You know, are we missing, have we missed something so far for only looking at 
kind of the aerial transmission by adults of this virus. And this kind of fits well with, um, yeah, that Jose and Tom and others have shown that about 90% of newly infected vines in BC were adjacent to previously infected vines. So this kind of indicates a, a slow or very local spread of GRBV, which could happen at the root level rather than at the foliage level. So just some questions for the future and, and kind of speculation about um, how GRBV may be spreading as well. And with that, I'd just like to thank all the different people who have uh, contributed to this research, uh, specifically Srabani Saha, who's a former PhD student, um, all the other members of my lab, as well as folks at Omafra and Covey and Brock, and of course the participating growers and funding. And thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Justin. That was uh, very informative and certainly good to see that there are plenty of opportunities for, uh, for further research. That's great. Um, I'll let you go ahead and stop sharing your slide and then uh, Wendy can get her stuff set up here. Uh, and reminder to everybody else, of course, who is attending, uh, feel free to use that Q&A function if you uh, have any questions. We'll address those at the end of all the presentations here. Uh, so Wendy will actually be doing two presentations for us today because uh, she had two different uh, cluster research activities going on. Um, the first one for activity 3B, which falls under this cluster theme of uh, management of virus diseases, uh, and then the other one for activity 18B, which is already concluded, uh, which focuses on uh, MALB. So I'll let her address that in a bit more detail, but before she dives in, I will give her a brief introduction. Dr. Wendy McFadden-Smith has been working in the horticulture pest management industry since 1990. She has been the tender fruit and grape IPM specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, or OMAFRA, since 2008. Wendy is also a Covey professional affiliate and adjunct professor at Brock University, where she teaches mycology and IPM courses. Her research interests include epidemiology and management of diseases and insect pests. Recent projects include evaluation of an expert system for grape diseases, monitoring for spotted lanternfly, managing vectors of virus diseases, management of sour rot, and mitigation of viral diseases, among others. She lives in Vineland Station, Ontario, with her husband, Brian, and her very handsome labradoodle, Oliver. Take it away, Wendy. That was Oliver that you could see. Thanks, Ethan. So I'm not going to bother introducing anybody to introducing you to the virus diseases because everybody else has done that already and I'm just going to jump right into what we've been doing. So I'm going to put my acknowledgements up first because otherwise I'll run out of time. So a crew of many years, I didn't hire all these people at the same time, uh, Sud Pujari's crew at Brock and the Wilworth crew, Jim Wilworth's crew for doing helping with the winter hardiness. So the objectives of this project were to determine the prevalence and distribution of the two viruses, where they came from, and the economic impact of virus infection in Ontario, to document the spread of the two viruses within vineyards and to adjacent vineyards, the effect of leaf roll and red blotch and solo and combination infections on cold hardiness, vigor, fruitfulness, yield, and fruit quality, develop some strategies to manage vectors of leaf roll three, and uh, eventually to develop best management practices for the two viruses. So we did uh, a number of samplings in 2018 and 2019 in the main viticulture areas in Ontario, uh, in Niagara, in Prince Edward County, and in Lake Erie North Shore with a variety of different grape varieties. So in 2018, we sampled 200, or we sampled 50 blocks randomly selected, uh, like truly randomly selected. And these were planted between 1995 and 2017. This is information we acquired afterwards. In 2019, we sampled 40 different blocks. These were also randomly se selected and the planting dates were 93 to 217. At each site, we collected 20 composite samples comprised of five vines per panel. So looking at the incidence of leaf roll and red blotch in 218 and 219 combined, 
The purple stands for combined leaf roll virus and red blotch virus. Green is healthy, red is red blotch only, and yellow is leaf roll only. So you can see that in those two years and the, the, the blocks that we sampled, there's a significant amount of infection of either solo or combined infections. Breaking it down into um, above or below 25%, 50% or 20, 51% of those vines in the 2018 and 19 sampling had more than 25% of the panels, the selected, the sampled panels infected, 49% were less than 25%. And of red blotch, 74% of the sam panels sampled were positive for, had more than, or 75% of the blocks we sampled had more than 25% of the vines infected versus 26%. So quite a bit more red blotch here than there is in BC. This is a combination of red blotch and leaf roll or leaf roll and red blotch just doing the counts of the individual viruses. So in these were, as you noticed, a lot of these vines were 10 years or older. So in 2020, we took a slightly different direction and decided to uh, selectively choose to sample vineyards that were planted in the last three years. So 218 to 220, the same 20 composite samples per block. And what you'll see here is 54% had no virus. 11% had both the viruses were co-infected, 15% leaf roll only, and 20% red blotch only. So these are vines that were newly planted within the last three years. Looking at the varieties, Cab Franc, Cab Sauve, a whole range of different varieties were negative. Looking into the positive for red blotch, a combination of uh, red vinifera, white vinifera, Sovereign Coronation table grapes and Marquette, um, one of the winter hardy, the cold hardy, cold hardy Minnesota varieties. In the leaf roll positive, uh, uh, both vinifera and leaf and um, hybrid, and in the co-infected, both red vinifera and baco. And just looking at the incidence within the range, this is just if it was either in, there was a positive of any kind or is, is, is counted in this percentage, the range of infection, for example, here with the red blotch, anywhere from one to 18 out of the 20 panels was positive, the same for leaf roll. And in general, there was more red blotch than leaf roll positives in the, the co-infected blocks. So in objective two, we are looking at the spread. So from the composite, from the results of the composite samples in 2018, we chose three vineyard blocks with moderate infections of red blotch and leaf roll. Uh, the varieties were Chardonnay, Cab Franc, and Vidal. And we sampled individual vines and tested them for red blotch and leaf roll three each year. So this was uh, anywhere from 100 to 250 vines per block. So looking at the Vidal block first, this is 218, 29% infected, 219, 50% infected, and 220, 84% of the vines that we, we sampled were positive. So each one of these cells indicates a single vine. Looking at their spray program, there was some question, they may have sprayed Movento in 219, and they hadn't sprayed, they sprayed Imidan for something in 220, but obviously they did not have very good control of the vector of leaf roll, which would be mealybugs and scales. In the Cab Franc, uh, went from 11 and 218, 12 and 219 to 21 and 220. And this is a kind of a cautionary tale where Movento was applied in 216 and 217, and then they stopped spraying in 218 and 219. So we had a little bit of control, residual control from 218 to 219 from the Moventos that were applied previously. But by the second year after those sprays, we were starting to get into trouble. 
This is in the uh, Chardonnay block, uh, nine, nine, 11, and 12 percent infection. And this was a very carefully managed vineyard for uh, the, the vectors of leaf roll. So you can see the benefit of managing vectors as far as spread is concerned. Looking at red blotch, the Cab Franc block that we studied originally tested positive for red blotch, but we couldn't find any after the first year. So now we're just looking at Chardonnay and Vidal. So a slight increase in, Chardon in the Chardonnay block. Once again, this is the same block that was very well managed. And in the Vidal block, we're getting up to 53%. So we have over 80% infect of the vines infected with leaf roll and 53 of those are infected with red blotch. I, didn't, I don't have a slide that shows the co-infections for this. So we are seeing significant, significant spread at one site, but not at the other. So at that Vidal site, there was an interesting thing that we noticed. Our assumption was based on the biology of the vectors that the spread would be from the, the wooded area on the west side of the block into the block. But what we found was that the predominance of red blotch positives were on the east side. So we took a look into an adjacent Baco block and every single vine in this Baco block across from the road, across from the roadway was positive for red blotch. So we suspect that there's somehow movement coming in from this way to this way. The next effects of red blotch and leaf roll on vines, we had replicated plots at the Cat a Cab Franc, a Chardonnay, and a Vidal site in 218 and to 221. And in 221, we added a Pinot Noir site. Each plot had a vine that was positive for red blotch, a vine that was positive for leaf roll, a vine that was positive for both, and a vine that was negative for both, so a completely healthy. So thanks to Nadia for this graphic, looking at what we did, we had six replicates. We took 120 berries per vine for later, per, per vine for later analysis. And then we did juice analysis for Brix TA, pH, malic acid, and yan. And grape analysis, which is going to be done, we'll be looking at anthocyanins and phenolics. So in the Cab Franc and the Pinot Noir, we'll be looking at that. In the Vidal Blanc, we'll be looking and Chardonnay blocks, the whites will be looking at Brix TA, pH, malic acid, and hydroxycinamic acids to determine the effects of co versus solo infections. So looking at harvest parameters, just an example, I'm not going to show you every single graph. Uh, this is the Vidal block in 2020. You can see that there is a reduction in yield with the co-infected relative to the leaf roll positive. So purple is leaf roll positive. This should say positive here. Leaf roll positive, red blotch positive. Uh, red is red blotch positive. Yellow is leaf roll positive and green is negative for both. So you can see that there was actually greater yield in the red blotch, the co-infected vines compared to the healthy vines. Uh, total yield was less in the healthy vines. But as Tom showed, uh, a difference in bricks. It wasn't statistical for us, but there were differences in bricks, TA, and pH. Um, a lot of this lack of statistical difference is probably due to the vine-to-vine the -vine variability because we only had six plots. Looking at vine vigor, uh, leaf roll positive, red blotch positive, lower vigor, Red blotch positive had a higher pruning weight and the leaf roll negative had the lowest pruning weight. So I'm not sure what's going on in the Vidal. The Cab Franc sort of behaved the way we expected with a higher pruning weight for the double negatives and a lower pruning weight for the leaf roll positives. Looking at cold hardiness, the purple line is the co-infected, green line is healthy. What you can see is Solo and uh, solo infections of leaf roll and red blotch reduce the cold hardiness. So this is looking at LTE 50, the reverse of the way looking at the way Tom did it. Uh, so you can see that these vines are less cold hardy than the uh, double negative, and the co-infected are even less 
cold hardy than the solo infected. In 2019, the difference was a little bit less and this was COVID, thank you very much. So our sampling was kind of curtailed, but you can see the same sort of trend that the double positive has definitely has less cold hardiness just as was shown in BC. Uh, the, in 2021, I decided to take advantage of Nadia's winemaking background and we decided to follow the, the pattern that the BC folks had done and look at the effects of, of uh, infection, co and solo infections on, on wine quality. So these are our, our red wines and these are our white wines and it smelled really good in my lab for a few months. Looking at the, the, the graphic, we did triplicate fermentations for both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, the wine analysis for both residual sugar, TAPH, malic acid, yan, free and total SO2 and acetic acid. And then in the reds, we'll be looking at anthocyanins and phenolics and in the whites, hydroxycinamic acids. So we're in the process of collecting this data now. Objective four was looking at merely as looking at vector management for leaf roll. We have been monitoring mealy bugs and soft scales actually since about 2013, but for this project was 2018 to 21. We put double-sided tape on the trunks and canes and changed them weekly. That started uh, late March, early April. And then once we started getting mealy bugs showing up on the tape, we'd start doing bark peeling timed for four minutes per vine uh, and count the number of each growth stage, egg clusters first, second, third, uh, in stars and adults. Whoops. So this is the kind of thing that we're seeing in the field. Here's our double-sided tape. And if you look at this, the scale here, this is less than a millimeter long. This is one of the, the crawlers that, that was seen on a tape. So it's definitely not something you'll be able to see with your naked eye, at least not my old eyes. So these were all counted. The crew then would go out and strip bark. And this is the kind of thing that we'd see in a severely infested vineyard. And when we're looking, this is easy to see, but for the first instars, we're looking at using a, a loop in order to be able to see them and count them. So looking at a, a season long for 2020, uh, all of our five sites combined, uh, red is egg clusters, yellow is adults, green, is first in stars. Blue would be first in stars that we found on the double-sided tape. Um, I guess we didn't find any second in stars. Purple was second in stars on tape and black is third in stars. And putting an anchor here, bloom is usually about the middle of June for us. So what we're targeting when we're looking at our, our monitor, our management right now is this, the first instars that come out in the summer generation because the first instars are the most effective vectors. They're also the most mobile as far as wind. So our timing for control is typically to apply Movento after bloom to give it a chance to move into the foliage and the, the uh, vascular tissue so that when the first instars feed, it will knock them down. So that's what we've been using this biology about. Typically uh, in other areas, pheromone traps are used to monitor and time their, their insecticide tra treatments. We have, I've had five years using Tracy grape mealybug lures in the vineyard and have caught three. In 2021, we decided to try traps with pheromones for grape, vine, obscure, and long-tailed mealybugs. And once again, grape mealybug or any other mealybug, zero to two midges a million. So something's going on. We're not sure what, but we haven't been able to use pheromones to um, time our sprays. So we're, we're still down to looking at, looking at uh, bark peeling. What we have decided to do is I've sent some samples of adult females to uh, Victor Pacheco at, in Uruguay. He's a, a mealybug taxonomist, and he is going to be looking at our samples for uh, morphology and also doing DNA sequencing for confirmation of the mealybug species. And this is important because we need to know what species we have to confirm that 
our management is going to be appropriate and also uh, to determine whether there, we need to use a different pheromone to, to monitor them. Looking at BMPs, we tried a couple things uh, before anything was published in BC, we tried looking at ABA, abscisic acid, as a way of mitigating uh, red blotch effects. So we did this in four, vari four varieties. We applied ABA in the form of proton at 400 ppm of ABA, applied it once or twice at 50% Verazon and two weeks later. And these are the results. Looking at uh, the mean weight of fruit per vine, uh, green consistently is no red blotch. Red is untreated, red blotch infected in each of these blocks. The polka dotted blue is one application of ABA and the striped is two applications of ABA. So in this case, red blotch decreased yield, but ABA had no effect. In these red blotch decreased yield, ABA increased the effect of red blotch infected, but is one better than two? Don't know. Uh, this is kind of going against everything that's been published elsewhere. So I'm not sure why it's working here. Looking at um, effects on bricks, uh, red blotch decreased bricks, no ABA, no effect. And in this block, Riesing block, and in the Cab Franc block that we tested, there was no effect on bricks. So as Tom had mentioned, the effect uh, can be seasonal and it can also be varietal dependent. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip this slide in this one. The other thing that we tried was mycorrhizae, trying to see if there was a, a, benef a health benefit to the vines for using mycorrhizae. So for two years, we've applied 200 grams of biocult mycorrhizae and 350 liters over a little under an acre. This was Cab Franc, I believe. No, Chardonnay, read your titles. Um, so purple untreated, uh, positive, green is, so purple is uninfected, un, purple is untreated leaf roll, positive, green is leaf roll negative, stripes are treated with biocult, both positive and negative, purple and green. And what it looks like is that there is a benefit for uninfected vines to receive the biocult treatment, but there doesn't, sorry about that, there doesn't seem to be a lot of benefit as far as recovering from the from the leaf roll infection. What are we doing in the final year? Another year of winemaking. We're gonna to try to increase the number of replicates to reduce variability. We're gonna continue collecting adult female mealybugs for more sites for DNA analysis. And I hope to develop a degree day model for timing the overwintering generation of mealybug emergence so that we can try implementing some of the methods that Tom's been using successfully in BC for man managing that overwintering population. Why 25% when I had those pie graphs of uh, above or below 25%? This is the decision-making uh, chart from Adela et al. from 2012 in New York. Look, and their, their cutoff point is above or below 25% infection as far as, as uh, thresholds are concerned. So what I'd like to do is generate thresholds for the Ontario industry, looking at varieties. So we also have vinifera and hybrid that was based strictly on a red vinifera plateau pricing versus VQA pricing, considering the cost of production in Ontario versus in, in the States and any penalties that the growers may have incurred. And from this, we can try to decide on our thresholds for management. Do nothing, rogue, remove. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, How if far like over to, was I? <laughs> that was perfect timing. That was great. If you want to jump right into uh, your MALV talk, that's great. Trying.
That is my very handsome dog, Oliver. Okay, so the other project that isn't virus related that I worked on through the cluster was mitigation of multicolored Asian lady beetle. Uh, this is a, a, a curse here, uh, the genus species Harmonia oxyridis, also known as the Halloween beetle or the Harle Harlequin lady beetle. It's native to Korea and other parts of uh, the East. And it was originally introduced to, on, to North America as a biocontrol. This, these are just the many variations of multicolored Asian lady beetle, but the typical uh, way to identify it is by this M or W on the pronotum. All these different colors all have that characteristic coloring on the pronotum. It doesn't cause direct fruit injury because they can't break through the skin of the berries. However, they will feed opportunistically. So if you have damaged fruit, fruit that's got splits, uh, bird damage, great berry moth, sour rot, they will go to those clusters. And they tend to aggregate in September and October on grape clusters when the sugar content is high so that they can get a feed to help them overwinter because they overwinter as adults. Why are they a problem? Because they produce uh, defensive compounds, especially methoxypyrazines and alkaloids that are secreted when they're agitated. And here we have an example. Thank you, Eric Glemser, for this photo. Here's a lady beetle with a droplet of that stinky stuff. Uh, the smell, atypical peanut, green pepper, vegetal aroma and flavor have been called ladybug taint. The threshold for these, as far as uh, organoleptic detection, 200 to 400 per ton, which works out to about a beetle per vine. That's all that you need in a, in a, to be able to detect the presence. Uh, back in 2001, this was a big deal. Um, the sky dome was closed because of the swarms of aphids that were followed by lady beetles. And this is when we first determined that lady beetle taint was an issue. The, the main method that we have for control is insecticides. They're very effective at killing lady beetles. They're applied just before harvest. There's no point in controlling the lady beetles before the harvester goes through. We have two products that are labeled, malathion, which is an organophosphate with a three-day PHI, and upside, or cypermethrin, which has a seven-day PHI. One of the things that was interesting that was determined by Pickering et al. in 218 was that 10 malbs per liter of wine did not affect wine quality after three days post-mortem. So as long as the beetles had been dead for three days or more, they will not cause taint in the wine. So that's important as far as timing is concerned. So the goals of this project to evaluate the effectiveness of alternatives for managing malb infestations, and to evaluate the efficacy of sorters or optical sorters uh, post-harvest for removing MALB. So for our repellent compounds, I basically did a, a literature search for anything that had the potential to be a repellent that was also uh, considered food grade. In our lab trials, we put 15 MALB into a, a container containing, I'll show you in a minute, I'll just show you the picture now. So we put 15 MALB in the center of uh, a container. Here we have the control grapes that have not been treated. Here we have grapes that have been treated with one of the potential repellents. And then we timed, did timed counts every 10 minutes for two hours. We would, look to, we would count the number of lady beetles that were on each of the clusters. We also did extended trials where we would go in and re, re, um, recover all of the lady beetles from the, the cages and bring back uh, other lady beetles 48 and 72 hours after treatment to see if there were long-term effects for, the, for the, the repellents that we chose. And here's just an example of some mal crawling around a treated grape cluster. So the products that we tested surround Timorex Gold, which is a tea tree extract, Buren, which is garlic oil, sulfobenton suspension and dust. So we did a, a liquid and a, a dust. This is a combination of potassium metabisulfite and bentonite. Biobenton is bentonite. Proud3 is a formulated product that contains thyme oil. Carvacrol is an extract from oregano. 
KMS is potassium metabisulfite, the same stuff that you use in the vineyard in the winery. We looked at basil oil, granite dust suspension, Ecotrol, which is another commercially available product in the States containing rosemary oil and peppermint oil. We looked at diatomaceous earth, uh, Captiva Prime, which is a capsicum, a pepper extract plus garlic oil, and then pine oil. So these are the results. Looking at two hours, so the short term timing, we picked the only the treatments that had more than 50% or 60% um, repellents. So Timorex Gold at 15 mils per liter, pine oil, KMS, Carvacrol, basil, and granite dust all looked pretty promising. So we extended those into 24, 48, and 72 hour uh, intervals for observation. And even at that length of time, the pine oil looked good. The Timorex oil was not bad. The granite dust kind of fell down. Interesting that the potassium metabisulfite, the carvacrol, and the basil oil were pretty pretty repellent at the twenty at the initial short term, but that effect died off very quickly, dispelled, dispersed very quickly. Uh, Eric Glemser did his master's looking at part of his master's was looking at using KMS to repel lady beetles, and he found that it was actually fairly effective in the vineyard. So I'm not sure what you did differently, but this is what we found. So then we went to the field in 2017. So we had five vine plots replicated five times. We applied with a CO2 backpack sprayer to the fruiting zone. Uh, we counted the number of beetles in the fruiting zone before treatment two to six and 24 to 28 hours after application. And this is the royal we because I did not climb, climb around on my knees to count beetles. So looking at day zero, initially, right after we did the application, MAKO, which is a cypermethrin that was available at that time, had excellent reduction relative to the control. Everything else looked fairly weak. Interestingly, the biobenton and the sulfobenton seem to have some effect later on in the 24-hour the period. So um, there is some potential for them. And once again, I'm not sure why the, the KMS fell down, but it did. So we also looked at uh, whether any of these products that looked like they had good potential in the lab or the field would have any impact on carry through or vinification. So we did some treatments of buran, pine oil, pine oil, and basil oil on a Chardonnay block, collected the fruit 24 or 48 hours after treatment. And this is the, these are the fermentation records and basically no effect. Uh, we were supposed to, we actually bottled this up and had it in the basement here at Omafra. That's a secret. Um, and we had a bit of a problem with the flood and some damage and COVID, so we never got around to doing the organoleptic sampling that we were supposed to do. Getting to the post-harvest removal in 2017, we looked at two different types of equipment, the Opti Grape, which is a, a destemmer built onto a harvester and an optical sorter. For each of these, we put 50 malb and 19 kilos of grapes. We added them to the paddles in the harvester and we dumped them into the bin for the sorter. Uh, we looked at the mog and the sorted fruit and looked at the number of malb and the juice was analyzed from methoxypyrazines. In 218, we just looked at the optical sorter and did the same analysis. So here's the Opti grape with the, the, the stemmer on it. And this is JP Perrant and Eric Glemser collecting some of the, fr the fruit that was the acceptable, the accepted fruit. This is the, the uh, optical sorter that we trialed in 2718. Um, here's the bin where the, the fruit would be dumped. It's fed up through an auger. There's a destemmer here, a conveyor belt, and then here is the optical sorter, which would actually use jets of air to propel the anything that was not a selected berry size and weight out into this chute down here. So this is what the sorted fruit would look like. And this is 
what it looks like in the garbage that comes out the 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 garbage side. So it's it's pretty good at selecting for the the type of fruit that we're looking for. So this is what it looked like when we were inoculating our our fruit before we put it into this order. And here we go. Okay, I see what happened. Sorry about that, guys. Something is going on. Sorry. This is my wonderful Amafra computer. Okay, this was supposed to be, that was supposed to show you the different places where we collected the, the fruit along the way, but I'll just progress to this one. Uh, these are some of, oh crap, sorry. I'm that person on the, the Zoom call today. Okay, these are, these are my, my trusty crew going through and sorting and looking for MALB in each of those different sampling points along the way. Looking at the Opti grape uh, with no distemmer, so we just put it through the harvester without the distemmer. We had 14.7 um, average out of 50 lady beetle with, without the distemmer and 4.7 with the distemmer. So even without the actual sorting, we had an improvement in the number of MALB that were present. With the, the optical sorter and 217, uh, we had uh, 0.5 uh, MALB per three liter sample with the optical sorter and the clean fruit versus four and a half or 10 and a half at the beginning. So a significant reduction here as well. And then in 218, um, we had some removal, but it wasn't quite as good as what we saw in 217. So both OptiGrape and the distemmer and the opti the OptiGrape distemmer and the optical sorter decreased the number of MALB. The methoxypyrazine wasn't detectable even at the very beginning with the fruit that we put into the sorter. So uh, just an acknowledgement for Craig Wismer, Vineland Estates, Hubel Grapes Estates for uh, equipment, Cave Spring Winery and Schenck Farms for uh, allowing us to work in their vineyards. Eric and JP were instrumental in the project, my research staff and Kevin Kerr for some of the slides that he provided to share with me. Thank you. Awesome, Wendy, thank you so much for uh, doing both those presentations for us today. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and take a drink of water. Had you talking for, for quite a while, so thanks very much. Uh, all right, Deb and Harrison, I'll let you load up your presentation here and I'll, uh, I'll do introductions for, for both of you, last but not least. Uh, just a reminder to all our attendees as well, feel free to use the, the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen there. And this is our, our final presentation. So once this one's done, we'll, uh, we'll get to all your questions. Uh, and to introduce our final two speakers here for activity four, Dr. Deb Moreau is a small fruit entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Kentville Research and Development Centre since 2014. She has a PhD in biology slash entomology from Dalhousie University. Her research program focuses on the identification, biology, and integrated pest management of emerging and invasive insect pests and vectors of economically important plant diseases such as viruses. Her lab is using conventional and newer technologies that include molecular barcoding for species identification and virus testing and GIS slash remote sensing for mapping landscapes. Recent efforts include characterizing commercial vineyards throughout Nova Scotia with approximately 1200 acres mapped to date, studying dynamics of grape phylloxera and other economic pests in commercial grape. Second here, we also have Dr. Harrison Wright. He was raised on a mixed farm in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. He holds several degrees, including a certificate for engineering at Mount Allison University, a BSc in physics and a BA in English from Acadia University, an MSc in agriculture and a PhD in biology, both plant physiology based and through Dalhousie University. Harrison began at the Kentville Research and Development Center driving a spray truck administering research trials. Uh, he completed postdoctoral work at Laval University, 
before accepting his current position as a research scientist with AAFC Kentville. Fun facts about Harrison that he provided to me, which I love. He has a pilot's license and he has sold the rights to his memoir to a local publisher. Without further ado, I will allow Devin Harrison to take over. Thank you. Hey, Deb, sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, we can't hear you right now. I'm not sure if maybe your microphone is. How did this work? I can hear you now. Yeah. The uh, swapping back and forth between Teams and Zoom. Uh, so, yeah, to kind of restate, uh, thanks so much for the invite. And um, my bit is going to be quite short, and I'll be passing the baton on to Harrison for the, the sort of nuts and bolts of what we did. Um, and kind of to echo uh, something Wendy said, um, I'm just going to skip over a lot of uh, the background since um, Tom and Justin and Wendy have adequately covered it. So uh, Harrison, if you want to move the slides, please. Harrison, <laughs> thank you. So, um, so we had kind of four objectives, but I wrapped them up into sort of three uh, general pieces. And I will speak to the first two again briefly and then let Harrison uh, cover, cover the Vine performance. So our first was to uh, establish bar status in selected commercial vineyard blogs. So that was really a, a survey to kind of screen viruses uh, throughout the province. And then also to, uh, while doing that, uh, look at those same sites for uh, where we did confirm virus for incidence of, of insect vectors. And then Harrison will follow up um, on the Vine performance piece um, as we try to explore short and long-term impacts of leaf roll viruses and red blotch. Next, thanks. So uh, for the commercial virus uh, survey, Egg Canada, in my program, we looked at 14 varieties uh, across the province and and we made an effort to, um, in every year, to kind of capture uh, sites that were located in all regions of the province, so north, south, west, east. Um, our focus at AFC was on established blocks, um, and we were fortunate that our efforts were complemented by provincial specialists in Perennia uh, that, con um, that also conducted and sampled uh, and tested for the same viruses in new vines that had been recently planted. And this was part of an initiative through the provincial government. So uh, it was kind of nice to be able to um, compare notes. So in total, between the two surveys, we captured 25 varieties, uh, looking at the three viruses initially. So leaf roll uh, three, one, three, uh, and grapevine red blot virus. A uh, little ways down the road, uh, both, both groups picked up uh, grapevine pinot gris virus. So in all cases, um, grape uh, leaf roll three was the most prevalent um, in it, pretty much everything we looked at. Out of the 25 varieties, um, 16 were hybrids and nine were vinifera. And, um, and, and consistently uh, leaf roll three was our, our most followed by red blotch and a tiny amount of leaf roll one and one site with family. We added uh, grapevine pinot gris virus to our testing in 2019, and it did take a year or two of kind of bumping around and, and optimizing the protocols before I think we were really confident with our results. And um, I guess uh, not surprising, but unfortunately we found a considerable amount, although it seemed to be targeted to certain varieties. But Overall, uh, 15 to 20 percent of all samples tested were positive for one or more of the viruses. But I think um, what's most interesting in terms of the survey, the general surveys piece, is that the incidence of viruses was pretty much constant uh, between when we compared the what we were seeing in established blocks uh, versus the newly planted. Um, and so for me, that's always been a you know a strong. Um, Something that's strongly supporting that that the vast majority uh, or the vast yeah the 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 likely source of our virus at this point in time um, remains uh, in new plant material coming in from the from the nursery. Harrison, next slide, please. So um, 
the incidence of in insect virus vectors is super important to me. And uh, we made every effort to do it in all of the commercial vineyards that we assessed for virus. So it was interesting to be able to, our hope was that if we found them, we could kind of go back and compare um, incidence of virus and spread through time. The only year as others have, have indicated, um, we did have a hit a speed bump in 2020 where, where we weren't committed to do that work. So um, we did. We do have great mealy bug uh, in this province, and although it remains very low um, and localized to date, we've only detected it um, in two sites. And in both those years, we found we first saw saw them on the trunk, and it was a somewhere close to 500 growing degree days. So in Nova Scotia, on average, that typically happens around mid July, and so these would be the adults um, from the overwintered crawlers that were likely moving back down the trunk to lay eggs. So um, for us, I, uh, to me, we, we this data, the growing degree day data came from Greg Loeb out of uh, Cornell. And um, so that's kind of the development that they reported around 500 growing degree days. We would not likely see crawlers of the, the first crawlers of the summer generation probably till mid August, and they they predict around 800 growing degree days. So, even though it's thought that we would like to see two generations of mealy bug in Nova Scotia, or certainly Eastern Canada, um, I don't think there's enough time or heat units actually for them to ramp up in any significant number. So, um, that that is a bit of a silver lining to date. So we had not in, been in a position to actually recommend to growers that they weren't, uh, you know, that sprays are needed to manage, to manage it. On the other hand, we do have significant amount of fruit lucanium scale, and Tom gave a, a great background on this test. It's commonly observed in vineyards, but really in most of our woody perennial crops, so high bush blueberry, uh, apple, and a lot of these other crops are, are in close proximity to, to vineyards. Um, but still, we're not seeing uh, significant shifts in changes in uh, virus amounts um, through the blocks uh, year after year. We've also been following buffalo tree hopper um, through sweeping within the laneways. And typically, our monitoring for all of the vectors is on a weekly or bi weekly basis. We have seen, we see them routinely in the you know, in our sweep nets, uh, and we do see the cane girdling um, observed, um, you know, in some of the, in some of the smaller canes. Uh, but, um, and we've seen this in blocks where we've had confirmed red blotch. We've not to date seen the insects actually feeding. Next slide. So uh, that was a really kind of fast trip for me uh, before I pass on to Harrison. So, um, so our, Initially, when the project was first proposed, there was a section where, uh, in addition to the sort of wider screening uh, of commercial sites, we would also focus on a couple, on a on a number of individual uh, blocks where we would do intensive sampling of individual vines, and we did that in earnest in 20, uh, 2018 and nineteen. We encountered a couple of hiccups here in Nova Scotia with the fairly serious. Uh, freeze in 2018, and there was a number of other problems. At that time, Harrison uh, took it upon himself to sort of a backup plan where we looked at potted plants and possibly establishing a small block on site, and he collected uh, infected tissue um, that we had determined in the, in the sort of general um, survey, and with tissue culture propagated um, some of the key varieties with uh, known single infection. But after 2020 hit, uh, we decided to refocus. And in our research uh, vineyard on site, which is approximately two acres in size, we established a 52, what we call what we call our 52 vine study uh, that involves three, three varieties of Vidal Blanc, Marquette, and New York Muscat. Um, all of those are significant varieties, um, significant hybrid varieties to a lot of Nova Scotia growers. And so, um, so this was a paired uh, vine study, and I'll let Harrison kind of go from there um, to talk about his findings. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Ethan, for the introduction. Can Ethan, can you hear me all right? 
Yeah, you sound great. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. Um, 52, and five, 52 vine study. That's where we left off. Okay. So first, I got so many windows open. Um, here we go. So first, I don't need to spend too much time on this. Uh, you know, most of the research has been done on vinifera, not hybrids. There's been a little bit work on hybrids. I was interested in Dr. McFadden Smith's work there on hybrids, but very scant in the literature research actually directed at hybrids. So most of this is from vinifera. Um, these two uh, virus has been associated with lower yield, pruning weight, anthocyanins, fruit quality, just a general term there, and bud hardiness. Um, in particular, I'm interested in this, especially in the context of hybrids. Uh, it's been associated with high, um, high acid, um, high potassium, and high pH in herbaceousness. So high acid uh, lowers your pH, high potassium increases it. Um, so we get in these weird scenarios uh, uh, where you can have high acid and high pH, and that, that causes a lot of trouble in, uh, in the winery. And then herbaceousness. These things could describe, you know, what some people don't like about hybrids in a cool climate, even at the under under not ideal conditions. Uh, if they if they do impact virus, uh, they are impacted by virus. I mean, that's only going to make the situation worse. So, um, I'll quickly uh, talk about the fifty two vine trial that Deb talked about again in twenty twenty. We weren't even we were barely allowed on site. We weren't allowed in commercial vineyards. So. Uh, we had to pivot and we came up with this 52 vine trial, which was in our own vineyard. Luckily, uh, luckily or unluckily, we had a fair bit of virus there. So as it was in situ pair design, as uh, Deb mentioned, um, we had three varieties, Vidal, with and without leaf roll three. We had 10 positive and 10 negative. So these aren't high numbers, but this is what we had to work with. Uh, New York Muscat, we also had 10 positive and 10 negative. And Marquette, we only had six positive and six negative. Um, so just, uh, and we only had two years. We had 2020, um, which is a weird year with COVID. And then we also had 2021. 2020 was also weird. We also had a freeze in Nova Scotia. Uh, it got down below minus 25 in our vineyard, which impacted yield a bit. But um, so the preliminary results, uh, I, I call it hints at a virus effect in hybrids. And again, uh, we had some look like some we did statistics on it we had some some effect but because of our low numbers uh you know we, we wish we had more numbers but this is this is to suggest that there's a virus effect so in the Vidal in 2020 we saw the Vidal berries actually had uh, greater berry size now we didn't measure berry number per cluster but you know i suggest this is probably due to poor fruit set or, or loose clusters in the Vidal they did have larger berries in 2020 um Lower bricks, I mentioned this, even though it's not significant, but in all, in, in all three cultivars in 2020 and two of the three cultivars in 2021, uh, the virus vines did have about a degree bricks less. And uh, we miss every degree of bricks in Nova Scotia if we lose it. So it had about a degree less, but again, the, the numbers were so up and down that it was variable. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was a trend there where there was lower bricks in the virus plants. Um, the Marquette did have higher acidity in 2021. Uh, just on the cusp of significance there. And the Dell had higher titratable city in 2021. Again, 2021, we had higher crop loads. And so this is where, this may be why we didn't see it in 2020 because the crop loads were fairly low in 2020. And maybe with those low, um, with those low uh, crop loads, we didn't see it. And finally, chlorophyll levels. We did see the lower chlorophyll levels in the Vidal in 2020, as well as in the Marquette in 2021. So um, we, we tested a whole bunch of things. Uh, I only bothered to mention the ones except for the bricks here that we did actually see statistically some differences in. Um, we will be doing, we will be looking, following these 52 vines again in uh, this coming growing season. Um, so again, as, as Deb said, uh, after some hiccups early on and with, you know, we, we thought what, what would be the ideal hybrid virus trial look like? And so um, Deb and Sud Pujeri and colleagues, they published this uh, paper uh, looking at the virus status in Nova Scotia in 2020. And so uh, we, we use this a little bit for guidance. Um, so just some of the results here, Th these numbers are based on five vine composite samples. They're not based on individual vine samples. This is five vine composite samples. So these numbers will be a little higher than they would be if uh, we were looking at individual vines. Um, but there's almost a thousand samples taken in total over hybrids and vinifera over three years. And measured uh, all these 
all these uh, viruses, seven different viruses. Um, the number one virus, as everyone has, has been reported in other regions, was leaf roll three. Uh, 22, almost 23% of the composite samples came back positive across hybrids and vinifera. Number two virus, uh, somewhat distantly behind that, was a uh, grapevine red blotch. And then the other viruses were found in just small amounts in Nova Scotia. But those are fairly significant numbers. Um, hybrids versus vinifera. This is interesting. So the hybrids, um, just, just short of 40% of the five vine composite samples were positive for one virus or another. Most of it was leaf roll three. Um, and the vinifera were almost 28%. So there was a significantly more virus in the hybrids than there was in the vinifera. And why this is, is purely speculation, but I suspect, uh, especially Nova Scotia, most of our early plantings were just hybrid. It's only been in the last 20 years where we've really, or even the last 10 or 15 years, where we've really seen significant plantings of vinifera. I mean, we've always had vinifera here, but uh, the numbers have really been skewing towards vinifera recently. And like I said, a lot of those older blocks were hybrids. Additionally, almost uh, predominantly all the hybrids are uh, own rooted cuttings. So much easier to propagate, much easier for a grower to propagate. So the fact that the hybrid hybrid uh, vineyards are older and own rooted and easier to propagate means there's probably a much greater likelihood that these vines weren't properly screened uh, for disease and were self-propagated and uh, probably these, this virus got spread that way. Um, so the most infected vari varieties, this is interesting. Again, they are both hybrids. Um, New York muscat, this is important cultivar in Nova Scotia, highly aromatic. It's used for a blender and a lot of things, especially Tidal Bay or Signature Wine. Um, again, this is five vine composites. Over 80% of those samples, the composite samples were positive, which is a high number. And uh, Marshall Foch, it's, it's sort of fallen out of favor recently. It was still, at the time the survey was still probably uh, the number one red hybrid, number red red probably being grown in Nova Scotia. Some of these blocks have been taken out though, especially after they found out the results of the virus. Um, so almost 70% of those five vine composite vines from the Marshall Foch blocks were infected predominantly with leaf roll three. So these are very high numbers. Um, so it kind of made me, th or kind of made us think like, well, you know, especially these prominent cultivars that we have in Nova Scotia, what would they taste like without the virus or, or is the virus having an impact? Um, so we thought if we had a structured trial, what, what would be most interesting? Well, one, we thought we'd not do uh, the in situ trials. It'd be, it'd be better to start with virus, to know that we were starting with virus so we could see how the, the venue's established with um, virus vines since uh, most of the spread is through cuttings or is through um, grafting or or for, through propagation. So we thought uh, in trial one, you know, we'd focus on leaf roll three, that's number one virus. Um, we'd wanna have New York muscat, it's highly infected. It'd be good to know what it, how it acts when it's not infected, both the establishment and long-term and the fruit quality. Marshall Foch would be interesting. It's, you know, very, even, uh, even though it's been falling out of favor, at least here in Nova Scotia, it's, you know, very widespread and well-known French hybrid. Um, the fact that it is so infected is an interesting question about uh, how well would it do if it wasn't uh, didn't have the virus? And finally, we wanted a white hybrid, and we chose Seville Blanc. We had, there's some Seville Blanc with leaf roll three. Um, in Nova Scotia, maybe a more natural choice would have been Lacadie Blanc. We have a, a lot of Lacadie Blanc, but uh, Lacadie Blanc is not widespread throughout Canada. It's mostly grown in Nova Scotia, and also interestingly, there's very little virus in Lacadie Blanc. We hardly found anything in Lacadie Blanc, which again probably speaks to the fact that there might be uh, not a lot of vectors in Nova Scotia, and because it's mostly grown in Nova Scotia maybe never had a chance to bring those viruses in. In the second trial, we wanted to look at uh, red blotch. That was our second most prominent virus. Um, and so we had Marquette in our own block. We had Marquette both with and red, without red blotch. So we propagated that. And uh, we came up with a nice statistical design. Again, this is something that's that's lack, lacking from a, a lot of uh, even the vinifera trials, um, being out of structured design. Um, so for the, we had a guard row here and uh, for the leaf roll block, our three cultivars, both with and without leaf roll three, we planted it with a nice Latin square. Um, the experimental unit is the panel, which contains four vines, not the um, not the individual vine. And then a separate little trial adjacent here, we are looking at Marquette. You know, it's a it's a relative of Pinot Noir and found throughout Canada has VQA status in Ontario. And we planted that out both with and without red blotch. Um, so. 
yeah, so we, we propagated, the, we found these vines, we propagated them, we multiplied them, and uh, we rechecked their virus status before planting them out. And then we planted them out in a nice little vineyard at the KRDC uh, Research Center on a, on a little slope um, last year. Uh, we, were, we were able to take a little bit of data off them this year and, uh, or last year, and also we'll be able to take data off them this year, but mostly just looking at the establishment, how well the vigor of them, how well they established, that sort of thing. So we'll only be able to sort, we'll be, only be able to answer those short-term questions within the scope of the mandate we were given in this project, but uh, we're hoping maybe that mandate can be extended in the next CAP uh, cluster project, but we will see. Um, and that concludes my talk. Perfect, Harrison and Deb, thank you both very much for uh, for rounding off the presentations here today. Uh, if all my lovely guest speakers want to go ahead and put their cameras back on, we uh, we have a little bit of time for our Q and A now, and I just uh, definitely think everyone wants to see your lovely faces when you're answering their questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague Bill Armstrong. Uh, he's going to help moderate the Q and A. Um, Bill, I did notice a few of the questions that were asked uh, have already had answers typed in, um, but maybe if you want to start by asking those questions out loud and, uh, and the um, people who answered them typed can, uh, can read out their answers out loud if possible. Hey, the first question is, first question is uh, what is roguing? And uh, this was for Harrison. Um, my speaker, yeah, I'm, I'm on, I guess. Yeah, I didn't know I was going to be having to answer this in person. Um, yeah, so I answered it, I guess, roguing is just identifying like uh, unwanted plants in the vineyard and then taking them out because they're rogues. Okay. Second question is how long after roguing a plant should we wait before replanting? So I guess I answered this again, I'm not sure if I'm the most qualified one, but I guess, uh, so I, I don't know, this is a challenging question to me. I, I think even without uh, replanting anything, you know, as enter planting is a difficult thing in a vineyard, especially if you have a vigorous vineyard, you know, filling in blanks, um, even just competing for light is an issue. Um, so th th those, even when you, when you lose a vine, that those canopies fill in fast. Um, I, think, I, I think a good strategy is like having a really good green vine, you know, that's already well established and digging a big hole and putting it in there is, is your best attempt at filling it in. in, in. Um, if the question was aimed at like replant, replant, you know, uh, isn't, a, isn't, a, isn't talked about a lot in grapes and apples and other cultivars or other species, it's talked about quite a bit, replant disease. Replant is when you have an old vine, all sorts of pathogens build up in the soil. You take that old vine out, you know, the pathogen level kind of builds with the robustness and the size of that plant. And then you take it out and put a little weak plant in and the pathogens just jump on it. Um, this happens in apples and other species and the, and the plant will just sit there stunted for, uh, for years and not do a thing. Um, this is less talked about in grapes, although I, I have a little bit of experience. We do, I've run trials at uh, the research center actually on this, you know, actually taking replant soils and pasteurizing them and not pasteurizing them putting plants in and, and replants definitely a concern or, or, or there's definitely a replant effect on certain soils and grapes as well. So uh, I guess the longer you can wait, the better. It's better to, especially if the, you can let those roots die and break down before, uh, and so some of the pathogens that are associated with them, maybe those levels die down a bit before you put new, that new plant in, or if you can put a bunch of some compost in with it or something like that to ameliorate that soil, uh, that's the best thing. Tom, did you want to make a comment or shall I? You're on mute. Trying to unmute. Yeah, you can go ahead first, Wendy. Okay, if the question is with respect to carryover of the virus, then there is no issue as far as we know because the vectors that we have don't overwinter or survive on the roots the way they do in other areas like because there are other species of, of mealybug. Um, and root grafting, isn't considered a way for virus to be transmitted. So if there are infected roots there, they're not going to infect the new plantings. Anything else I've forgotten? I will just add a little bit to it. We uh, certainly that's true for leaf roll virus. So these viruses have to live in, so they have to be in a living vine. 
So you pull that vine out and the, the roots are gonna die off pretty quickly. They can persist a little while, normally not a problem. So if it's leaf roll, these are vectors that are in, they're infecting the, uh, the green, the living tissue above the ground. So that's not a problem. But uh, the work suggestion that uh, Justin Rankema has about possibly the soil dwelling stages of the plant hoppers, mm -hmm. I might be a little bit worried about putting a replacement vine in a site that had uh, prior red blotch virus infected vine, because those are, I believe, not host specific. And uh, Justin can maybe comment on that. But the uh, immature stages, they could be in the soil and uh, reinf uh, reinfect those vines. I don't think we've had enough time to look at that yet, but maybe Justin would want to comment on that. Um, sure. My comment is that my idea about root feeding plant hopper spreading GRBV is pretty speculative at this point. So it, it's uh, no hard evidence, but, um, and we don't even know if this species would necessarily feed on grape roots, but it could be possible. So, yeah. yeah. So generally we'll say you can go right ahead. Uh, it's good, get, get a replacement vine back in there right away. That's our attitude in Ontario too. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Justin, it comes from uh, Dieter Kahl. Uh, my biggest regret in my research was not including herbaceous recipient plants in grapevine red blotch transmission experiments for faster symptom development. Do you plan to include herbaceous recipients in your future experiments like Flasco et al. did in their 21 study? And, and my answer is, is yes, I hope to try some of that this summer. Um, it just, if we can get the virus transmitted by the insects into beans or bean leaves, then the symptoms uh, can show up more quickly than in potted vines and we can get an answer about um, transmission quicker. So we will try to replicate what's kind of the cutting edge stuff that's being done at Cornell for sure. I guess the next question is uh, for you as well. Is Milana Laris president in BC? Um, yeah, so I maybe Tom has an idea about this one too, but I think, so the species that we suspect it is, which is Aridus in Ontario, um, I think is found in the Western US, um, definitely California and Oregon, I think. So there would be a fairly high likelihood that we have that species in BC as well. And if not the same species, definitely the same genus, I would suspect would be in BC. I don't know, Tom, have you ever found Melanolieris in your, in your work? Uh, I wanted to ask you when you're finding it mainly, uh, early season for the adults that, uh, so I'm not sure our timing was perfect, but I'll answer quickly that yes. In fact, uh, my wife who takes photos for uh, entering um, electronic databases, she just, uh, I think it was last week, record, recorded a uh, photo of uh, your favorite uh, suspect there. So yes, we do have it out here. It hasn't been looked at closely. As you mentioned, very little work has been done on plant hoppers. And it wasn't something that was initially on our radar. We were following up more on the, uh, the tree hopper end of things. We did include some other species. As I mentioned, the 500 insects that were included in Dieter's work that we use the artificial feeding system. Uh, there was a range of insects in there. Um, tree hoppers uh, were the only ones that were shown to be um, capable of transmitting. The next question is, is there a model describing how grapevine red blotch evolves over time? Or in other words, do we know how long it may take for undetectable levels to become detectable? I don't know. I'm hoping Jose is on the call and he can speak up or Sid. <laughs> I think it's two to three years. Okay. 
That's and, pull, that's pulling an answer out of a very far back single firing neuron in my head. Okay, the last question is, is spray recommended on scouting or light cycle timing? This is for you, Wendy. Which insect are we talking about? Mealybugs or MALB? I think it's MALB. Not till right before you're gonna harvest. There's no point in going out until then. Um, <clears throat> and generally the, the winery is gonna go out and, and the basic feeling is if they see a lady beetle, then they're gonna ask you to spray. I do have I do have uh, anecdotal evidence from a grower who did have a mal problem last year, and called me to ask what to do, and I said, unofficially, spray KMS, and they went out and sprayed KMS and harvested right afterwards, and they had no lady beetles in their grapes. Hmm. But it's not it's not registered. Okay. Thank you. And that concludes uh, all, that's all the questions that we have. So we'll turn it back over to Ethan. Perfect, thank you, Bill. And thank you for uh, all our panelists for answering those questions. If anybody uh, watching the webinar does still have a question, you've got a couple minutes left to fire it off. Uh, I'm just going to briefly share my screen once again. We just have a few quick, uh, quick final thank yous and whatnot. So obviously we want to give a first special thanks to all of our presenters today, uh, Tom, Justin, Wendy, Deb, Harrison, thank you so much for, for sharing your expertise and giving us a lot of insight into the work that you've been doing for the grape and wine cluster over the last several years and for the one year now remaining in this program. We uh, certainly appreciate the efforts you've put in and you've, you've shown us that there's a lot of work done already and still a lot of work to be done. So hopefully we, uh, we continue to see the results of your work for for a while. Uh, I just have to quickly show this slide here to ensure that legally we can post the webinar recording for the, the presentations from our AAFC scientists there. And then just a quick little plug again here at the end for the remainder of our webinar series for 2022. Uh, this one was our fourth webinar and we have four more coming between now and the end of June. So you can see them on the, the screen there. We still have three different cluster research updates uh, under the three different themes for a sustainable management of soil, water, and crop quality. That one's on April 28th and three weeks from today. Crop protection and monitoring will take place on June 9th. And then optimizing quality of Canadian wines will uh, occur on June 23rd. Sandwiched in between there, we also have a webinar for Pinot Gris virus and serotocline, which will take place on May 26th. If you want details or want to be informed about when these uh, webinar registrations become available, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter, which goes out about every month or so via email, or you can check our website to stay up to date on, uh, on details of all of those events as well. Uh, so that's all that we have for you today. Just once again, I want to, to thank all of our guest speakers for being here. Thank you, Bill, for uh, co-moderating and helping out the Q&A. And thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, like I said, the webinar was recorded today. So uh, in, in a day or so, when I send a follow-up email to all of you, there will be a link to the recording in that as well. So you'll have access to that and you can share it if you would like. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We timed that pretty perfectly, actually, almost 3 o'clock on the dot. So well done, all of us. Uh, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you all uh, for the remainder of the webinars we have this year. Have a great rest of your day, folks. Thanks. Take care. Goodbye, everyone.